Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sounds like I'm on. Oh, no, uh, Steve is on. Steve, you can welcome everyone. I had it in the book that I was going to welcome everyone. So, but if you're there, you can welcome everyone. Okay. Well, good morning <clears throat> and welcome to Trinity Episcopal Church in person and online, even in Florida on this uh, 12th Sunday after Pentecost. We were clear who was supposed to do this part. So all I'm going to do is uh, tell you a couple of things um, <clears throat> such as, what day is today? It's the 15th. Okay. So Wednesday, we'll have Kaplan at uh, seven o'clock online. We'll have morning prayer for probably about the next month or so um, coming into uh, mid-September. Um, <clears throat> there is no vestry meeting today. There will be a vestry meeting next Saturday, uh, the 21st coming up at 10 o'clock. We have also decided due to staffing reasons to postpone the uh, fish well that was supposed to be on August 27th. I think the vestry is probably going to be deciding Saturday where we're going to have it. And as always, um, the office is open Wednesday afternoons. Sometimes Terry is in there to print stuff because apparently humidity and the printer don't agree with each other. But if you want to get something in the print in the uh, bulletin, try to get it to, to her by noon or one o'clock on Wednesday. And now, live from Florida, here's Father Christian. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so, um, or, or I should say, thank you for welcoming me uh, once again. And it's actually not very sunny. It's a cloudy because Fred is coming through, a tropical storm Fred. Uh, and uh, on the way after that is Grace, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but for right now, we're just having a little bit of rain and a cloudy day. It feels like a north day uh, being in the Midwest uh, with a cloudy day. We don't have that too many here. Uh, but, uh, but, but good to be with you. And uh, um, it looks like we're going to open with opening him on this day. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first lesson is Proverbs chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To these 
To those without sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 34. The response is, Fear the Lord, you that are his saints, before and after. And we will read it by alternating full verses. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The young lions lack such a hunger. Come, children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who among you loves life and desires long life to enjoy prosperity? Keep your tongue from evil speaking and your lips from lying words. Turn from evil and good. Seek peace and pursue it. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. that are his saints. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. The second reading is from Ephesians, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do hymns and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times, and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you. And Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat to the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The gospel of the Lord. Praise in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Wherever you are, you may be comfortable. Well, again, this is good to be with you. Um, and uh, this morning, uh, here at All Souls, I started with this uh, little picture uh, for everyone. Uh, that's uh, one Sunday morning at the communion railing, as the pastor went down giving communion, uh, she came to a small young boy. The pastor broke off a small piece of bread and placed it in the boy's hand. And the boy looked at it and said, uh, I want more. A little surprised, the priest taken back, never had that happen before, uh, said, well, son, I promise you that it is enough. And that's kind of where my sermon uh, is going today, uh, is asking for more when it really isn't really enough uh, once a week. <clears throat> and I don't know if you all remember when I was there, but probably not because I, I may have mentioned it, but I'm really a t-shirt and shorts kind of guy. Uh, you know, 14 years ago, they gave me this outfit, really my last outfit I'll wear, uh, besides when I'm not uh, acting clerically, and I wear a t-shirt and shorts. But uh, one t-shirt that I saw years ago, ago drew me in from the beginning. It was an Episcopal church t-shirt from the very first Episcopal church that I ever served in Geneva, Illinois, St. Mark's in Geneva. And it's the same one that actually Kate, my wife, and I were married at 18 years ago tomorrow on our anniversary. So, but on this shirt, I want to describe it for you. Maybe I did years ago when I was with you. But if you remember, maybe not if I didn't mention it, but there was a Jerusalem cross on the front and on the back, there was a picture of the Holy Eucharist. It had the chalice, and then it had above it a part of the priest host. And um, it symbolizes for us the climax of the Eucharistic service, where bells are ringing, and we all, in a unified, bold proclamation, say amen. This is the culmination of the moment to which the whole liturgy that we use in the Episcopal Church points. After having recalled our Lord's words of institution, this is my body, this is my blood. And having asked God the Father through the Holy Spirit to bless and sanctify, to make holy these gifts, we say with a loud resounding together, Amen. Proclaiming the heart's desire of all who have just prayed for this to happen, saying, Amen, would it be so, or be it so, translated from the Hebrew, or even make it so, when we say Amen. Believing that just as Jesus was present offering himself to his beloved disciples in the upper room, a very long time ago, he nonetheless is with us as we have asked the Lord to set apart, bless, sanctify the gifts of bread and wine that we have in front of us in our own day. Now, under this amazing picture on the back of this t-shirt said this caption, which also took me back. It said, what other meal can sustain you for a week? Now, when we think about that, um, and I've thought about it after three years of seminary and 14 years of ministry, and a number of lectionary cycles, the three-year lectionary of preaching on this John's Bread Discourse from chapter 6, I find myself questioning that high and lofty ideal, whether a meal can sustain us for a week. Not questioning the sustaining and satiating power of the real presence 
in the Eucharist, because the Lord can do anything, but rather the intention and purpose of the one who is giving it. And with that, it's no coincidence that in John's bread discourse, which we've been reading for a number of weeks now, we have still another week to go, our gospel lessons and others have been focused on talking also about Moses. It was mentioned today in our reading, Moses and the manna from heaven, given by God to his chosen people in the wilderness. In Exodus 16, if you recall this passage and this story, uh, that, uh, that God didn't God didn't send bread from heaven just once a week on the Sabbath, right? God fed his people, sustained and satiated them with what they needed each and every day. The people were to go and collect the, uh, the manna from heaven. He said, what is it, right? Uh, and they were able to scoop it up and store it only for that day and use it that day. They could only store it on Fridays to take them through the Sabbath day. Otherwise, what was left over turned to mush, and they could not use it. God did not give them all they needed for a week or for a month or for a year or for a lifetime. His intention was bigger than that. He wanted them to be reliant upon him, upon his provision, upon his goodness every day. And I think about it this way. <clears throat> My children now are six and four. And believe that. And on a long car ride going up north, which we'd love to do, um, sometimes we'll give them something to eat in the car, which we don't really love to do. But if we give them a bag of crackers, they might be quiet for 15 or 20 minutes, right? But if we give them one to two crackers, which keeps it a little more clean in the car, which is good, they're back with hands open in a few minutes. And that's how it is with God and us. God's aim is to build up, use, and sustain his people. But in order for that to happen, we must look to him, love him, know him, call out to him each and every day, every minute of the day. God is good. We come in here. We come, you all come into um, Trinity uh, and Platteville week after week. And God provides food indeed for us in the Eucharist and in much more. And all he simply asks of us is that we are hungry. And then we come to him. It doesn't matter what we do, what we uh, did for a living, how we're dressed, how we smell for that matter. What matters is that we are hungry. That we're hungry today, tomorrow, and the next day for more and more of Jesus. You know, the people of Israel had to collect their bread from heaven each and every day. And that's how God liked it. That's how he designed it. That's how he designed all of us to be in relationship with our God each and every day, not just once a week, not just once a month, not just once a year. He wants us coming back to him each and every day, every minute of the day for more. It's a lovely sentiment and speaks to the innate power of the Eucharist to think of it sustaining us for one week, week by week, Sunday by Sunday, Eucharist by Eucharist. But that's not how it really works in life. We need more and more of Jesus, especially with all the difficulties, trials, challenges that we have week in, week out. And that really wasn't even the intention of the gift given, nor the one who gives it, that we would just come to him once a week. Again, he needs us and wants us each and every day, which is okay, because I've said it here many times, and I've probably said it when I was, when I was with you, uh, a reminder that we leak, uh, we leak, uh, we are broken vessels ourselves, even though many of us have been mended in many places, we still are broken people um, at the potter's hand, um, who is trying to always fix us as we allow him to do so. Uh, and we are always working out our salvation. We're never done. And besides that, we are also called to pour into others. And so as we pour into others, we become replenished as well. So not only do we just leak over time, but we also become, um, become empty. Uh, um, our level comes down, depleted, by pouring out into others. And so we really need that food from heaven, that bread from heaven in Jesus, who is the bread of life. And we need it each and every day. And that's also behind what some people do in church for the daily Eucharist. Um, 
I know I wasn't able to do it with you or with Trinity in Wisconsin, but um, I'm not sure if the cathedral does it. Um, I know one parish around in our area here in Florida that does daily Eucharist. And they're able to do it, but they have to use help. I've been down there to help myself on a day when they had no other clergy to do it. Uh, but that's the drive behind daily Eucharist and churches that can do it, is that, is that we need that. We need to be fed uh, with the presence of God each and every day. But we're also reminded that not only are we fed in the Holy Eucharist, but we are fed as we study God's word, as we pray, as we sing spiritual songs, as we come in contact with other believers, sharpening one another, as iron sharpens iron, in different community groups and Christian groups and small groups, where we can meet God wherever we are, in whoever we are with, even in our cars, on the beach, in the woods, even at the mall, we can find our Lord. And we need to remember what St. Augustine said. He said, the point is that we need to make sure that each day we are hungry. That there's enough room inside of us for another presence. He goes on to say, if you are filled with your own opinions, ideas, righteousness, uh, sufficiency, you are a world unto yourself. And there is no room for another. So the only ticket, brothers and sisters, the only prerequisite, and receiving Jesus at the altar or any other time is that we would be hungry. We'd be hungry for him and make sure there's room enough for him by pushing away all the other. As Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, this last week, I found myself uh, in a debate with one of the youth of today. If there's any youth there today, uh, Mr. Prestigard. Uh, uh, in the pews, uh, um, and, uh, and I had a debate about what makes a Christian a Christian, that is, who's who in the church, talking about uh, different denominations and other things, and um, I found a real good definition of a Christian from Richard Rohr in his book, Divine Dance, and he says, a Christian is one who is consciously drawing upon their source, consciously drawing upon their source. And again, for us, our source being Christ the Lord. Which means that all we can do is jump on the train, which is already moving, says Richard Rohr. Unless we are present before the presence, there is no real presence for us. We must be hungry. We must be hungry each and every day. And so the question that uh, we come to today, uh, as we're in this red discourse of, of St. John, is a question if we are hungry, or are we filling ourselves with everything else under the sun besides our Lord? You know, the world around us is full of really cool things. Uh, pop culture said in the 60s, it was drugs, sex, and rock and roll, right? Uh, today, we might say that the culture might say, it's me, myself, and I. Uh, so all that I want to do, when I want to do it, uh, no, matter, no matter who says what. Um, or just forgetting to fill ourselves at all. Uh, downgrading what the church has, has said and offered. saying we don't really need that. Well, again, Richard Brewer has said it right. A Christian is one who is consciously drawing upon their source. Constantly, that means all the time. That source being Christ himself. And so again, the question we are faced with through this uh, life is, are we hungry for Christ? Are we hungry for more? Are we at the altar asking for more? Are we back in our pews during worship asking the Lord for more? Are we taking advantage um, of the church? <clears throat> taking advantage of the church sounds bad. Taking advantage of the church, saying, Lord, I need more. Or, Father, I need more. Can you pray for me? Or, brother, sister in the church, can you pray for me? I need more. Waking up and going to bed, asking the Lord for more. When we're stressed out, worn out at our wit's end, asking the Lord for more. And soon become persons who are always coming to the Lord, hungry for more. Looking for more than just that one fill up during the week, but each and every day. Of course, being careful as Paul warns of how we live, not as unwise people, but wise, making the most of our time. 
not being foolish, not indulging too much wine, coarse talk, or debauchery, but making and taking the time to understand the will of the Lord, being filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst ourselves, as Paul says, giving thanks to God the Father at all times, saying, so be it, make it so, give me more, more of him who bids us to come all the time, each and every day, the true and living bread that came down from heaven, our source, Jesus, God's own son. Amen. Looks like our liturgy continues in our bulletin with the words of the Nicene Creed. Page 358, or they'll be on our computer. Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one Lord. Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, and him for all things we made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and the man. For our sake, he was crucified and brought to sight of He suffered death and buried him. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory and judgment with the living king of and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Southern Church. We acknowledge our baptism for forgiveness of sins. We work for the resurrection of the dead. Okay. Continue with the prayers of the people. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in our daily life and work, our families, friends, and neighbors, and those who are all this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of honor, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the need. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation and for others. We pray especially for Peggy and Bill, Bob, for Abby, Catherine, Carolyn, for Karen, David, for Jeanette, Andy, Wes, Betty, Rich, Rock, Doris, Linda, Naomi, June, Evan, Young, and Larry. For your mercy is great. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord. For all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name, Reverend and forever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We put their trust, trust in you. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now summing up all of our prayers, we pray as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Provide us the kingdom, the honor, and the glory forever and ever. general thanksgiving saying together almighty god we your unworthy servants give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all who are in your name and bless you for our creation preservation and all the blessings of this life but above all for your grateful love and your redemption of the world by our lord jesus christ for the means of grace, may have the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your grace, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in your holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we do the Holy Spirit, we honor and glory. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, may with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks God. God.